just so there's, there's a little bit of awareness, I'm having some clicker issues, but it's a post-lunch, post-microlab situation, so everything's going to be fine. <laughs> um, I wanted to start with a quick poll, if you don't mind indulging me. Um, let's say you or your family member, your kid, um, let's say you were feeling some uncomfortable health symptoms. Let's say you're feeling some uncomfortable health systems. Um, symptoms, sorry. Um, and you were really, you know, concerned, you wanted to seek care as quickly as possible. And I'd like you to respond to this poll with clapping, in part because that helps us to see scale and in part because I love applause. <laughs> so let's begin with, you have these health symptoms. Um, for how many of you is the very first thing you do immediately is rush over to your closest walk-in clinic. Just round of applause. Who heads over to the walk-in clinic? All right. How many of you are lucky enough to have a close friend or relative who's a health worker that you can just call up right away, tell them what's going on, and hopefully they'll have an answer for you? Awesome. How many of you would head straight over to the CDC or the World Health Organization's information websites? Wow, we've got some compliant physicians in the room. All right, and how many of you would go straight to Google and search for your symptoms? Woo! All right. Um, if this, if this were an American audience, it isn't 100% a, a American audience, but if it were an American audience, we would have had 80% of the room clapping, with 85% of women and 75% of men who have over the last year searched for health information online. And this is very important when we're considering populations that may not have access to a physician or to a healthcare facility close by. So we need to start considering what the world looks like when the primary care provider is no longer the primary provider of care. So we know that public health misinformation exists on the internet, and we know that this is a challenge. A few key examples include a recent paper that came out this last year that identified Twitter bots or fake Twitter accounts um, that had led to overall positive sentiments among a population at risk of smoking um, about e-cigarettes. We know that in the 2014 to 2016 Ebola outbreak, online misinformation led to an increased death toll, but there's also um, a lot of research that has led to um, the idea that policies were enacted and um, aid or lack thereof was endorsed in the region because of misinformation that existed in our online ecosystem. We know that water fluoridation conspiracy theories, especially in Australia online, have led to increased hospitalizations for mass extractions for children. Um, and we know, we know that vaccine misinformation on social networks has led to decreased herd immunity and the reemergence of eliminated disease such as measles, but it's not exclusive to measles. So it's a big challenge and we need to address it. So how do these things happen? Of course, there are bad actors who, for divisive reasons, because they want to divide people ideologically, will knowingly spread misinformation online. But the way that public health information authorities currently communicate with the public also plays a role. And of course, we want our target populations to consistently be receiving the best possible information from us, um, but we need to make sure that it's also the most relevant for them. But does it? What does the current public health information life cycle look like? So this little human is any one of us in the room who was super eager beaver about public health, so we probably pursued some sort of a degree. We wanted to learn more. And in our degree and in our process and in our pursuit, we learned the language of epidemiology. It was complicated. We learned the language of statistics. Perhaps we learned how to analyze these statistics. And with our colleagues, we began to use this language, a shared language that we had learned and could now share with one another. And we would write these amazing papers, and we would discuss them with our colleagues because we were so proud of what our innovations had led to. And if we were lucky, these scientific papers, with the language that we did have to learn, fully embedded throughout, 
um, would get picked up by media, would get picked up by news media, by social media, on radio, on television. But again, it's using the language that we had to learn in order to use properly. And when it ends up with our end user, our target population of this information, they're probably going to be a little bit frustrated. And then what? It doesn't end there. What do they do with this frustration? For somebody who cares about their health, when they encounter information that they don't understand, they're not going to stop there. So it's important to consider the context that our target reader is actually living in. And the context looks a little bit like this. They're immersed in videos, they're immersed in memes and in images, short and emotional messages and compelling headlines. And it's understandable that when encountering this information that's difficult to understand, they turn to the stuff that they do understand that's a little bit more clear. Sources like Pinterest or Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or Google searches for that matter. And these are all sources that the public health community needs to take seriously. Our target audience, that end user who's the recipient of the information that we provide, they will find health information that they can understand, but it might not be the right information. Uh, a close friend and colleague of mine on Xiaomina put it, put it really well. She highlighted that if public health communi communicators aren't thinking about search engine optimization, for example, highlighting and how to use keywords that increase the visibility of our content as opposed to content that's easily understandable but false, we're going to lose. We're no longer living in this broadcast media society where a public health information authority can publish their work with one message and share it with audiences effectively. We're competing with pop culture representatives and pop culture methods, and we need to realign our approaches. So to illuminate these two challenges, to illuminate these challenges, I have two case studies to share. Um, with uh, epidemic or misinfodemic responses. And I'd like you to keep two things in mind as I present them. One of um, what content you think is the most accessible and what content you think is the most spreadable or will best reach your target audience. So we'll start with the case of water fluoridation. Um, there was a study that was published, it was a meta-analysis that was published by Harvard University that had some very nuanced conclusions and some big methodological challenges, which included the fact that the studies they included in their large analysis were flawed in and of themselves and took place in China. So could the results be extrapolated to a US context? No. Could they trace some of the results that they found to water fluoridation? Also no. But it got published. And of course, it led to easily sensationalized news headlines that made people think that water fluoridation was a serious problem, which it wasn't. And group identities began to form online to share information, um, misinformation about uh, these headlines and the study. And it was connected with poor health outcomes. It actually led to some policy changes in communities where they would remove fluoride from the water and it would lead to, as I mentioned with the ex um, example in Australia, tooth decay and mass hospitalizations for extractions for children. So I searched for water fluoridation on Google and of the top search results, two were misinformation. The problem is that the language that the correct information contained within the PAHO World Health Organization website was challenging to understand. It contains lengthy words, it talks about morbidity and mortality, and the language in the misinformation responses was much easier to understand. It talks about risks and things you should avoid in top 10 lists. Now let's look at the social media response. We have the public health response produced by the American Dental Association. Uh, this data visual visualization didn't make perfect sense to me at first, um, but what this is, these visualizations are not depicting you know, the number of deaths that would occur from water fluoridation, which is to be expected. It's trying to communicate to you how much is 0.7 milligrams per liter of water. And the analogies that they use and the metaphors that they use to demonstrate this include an inch in 23 miles, 
random. One minute in 1,000 days, which is converted to 2.74 years, in case you are wondering. And one cent in $14,000. None of these numbers are you know, consistent with one another. It's a bit of a difficult visualization to follow. And the important message, the important takeaway, is that the public health benefits are big. And if you can see in my underline, it's written really small. Let's compare this to the mimetic misinformation that exists. There's poison in the tap water. Even in its most diluted form, fluoride is still a poison and can harm your health. All false. But does this visualization even address those concerns? A similar example is with HPV vaccine hesitancy. We know that a fraudulent study that was retracted um, over a decade ago has led to widespread vaccine misinformation online. And the challenge is, is that it's normalized vaccine hesitancy. And there have been targeted disinformation campaigns or the intentional spread of false information related to vaccines. So again, searched on Google, two of the top results were true factual information, which is great. But the terminology in there, again, refers to HPV as an important cause of morbidity and mortality, or references the bivalent, quadrivalent, and nonvalent vaccines. As compared with the misinformation or the vaccine hesitancy endorsing information, the chair is that just because it got approved doesn't necessarily mean you should get it. And that's a lot easier to understand. What about the visual responses on social media? The public health response. The CDC has 1.16 million followers. And if you can see with this tweet, we've got one reply, 43 likes, 51 retweets. That's, that's, that's an improvement. But if you read through this tweet, they are targeting parents. You can protect your son or daughter by getting them the HPV vaccine. But the tweet starts with a hashtag DYK. How many of you in the audience, let's go by applause, is familiar with DYK as a hashtag? All right, and how many of you are parents? You know what? That was not what I expected and I appreciate it. I didn't know what it was. I had to look it up. I like to think of myself as relatively social media savvy. But it didn't seem like the message was targeted for the target audience. And it, again, doesn't address the clarity, the succinct misinformation that you can see in these memes. All right. All right, perfect. And as we saw with those examples, especially with the CDC example, even if we have the capacity to reach large audiences, if the content itself is inaccessible, we aren't going to achieve our goals. So combining health information that we want to communicate with something engaging or interesting or entertaining, something in, that involves users in actually seeking the information and sharing the information, is a way that will be successful. Sorry, my slides aren't joining me just yet. All right, and the key question is how. How to effectively reach readers at scale. How can we meet users not in a new platform that we're directing them towards that contains all of the information we're hoping they'll know, but how do we make sure that we can get them where they're already at, in WhatsApp, on Twitter, on Facebook? And how can we make sure that the information we share, we share with them can reach a large enough audience to impact at scale? So I wanted to share an example of a project that my team at Medan is working on. We're collab we've actually collaborated with WhatsApp to develop an automated conversational tool that helps users remain anonymous when they're asking questions. For this project, they're specifically sending in submissions and questions related to the Indian election. And they can send in questions in many languages. They can send in questions in Telugu, in Malayalam, in Bengali, in Hindi. And there's a rapid response strategy where if someone has already sent us the question and we've produced a response for it, they will automatically receive an answer. So what we made sure to do when someone sends in a piece of information is not only respond to them with a response of whether something is true or false, but also with something a little bit interesting, like a meme or a GIF. 
So here we see someone sent in a question, or a statement rather, that a circulating message warns not to consume arid drinks such as Coca-Cola after eating mangoes because the two combined can form a po potent poison that causes instant death. Very challenging to respond to, and here you can see an example of what the back and forth conversation looks like. So what we did was not only combine uh, the information with entertainment, but also made it readily shareable in a platform where users are already hanging out. So there's a greater, greater potential for virality, and the correct information can get to audiences faster. And we can already see the potential that this could have on access to public health information, to health workers who need responses fast, or to audiences who, if they don't understand the content that we're sharing with them, will search elsewhere. So with the Medan team, um, with the Medan team, we have started to build out the necessary collaborations in order to ensure that the content that we're releasing to users is appropriate and that it's also interesting and engaging. We want to line up our goals of access to the internet and access to health as a potential way that might be lower cost of achieving universal health coverage through access to information. And we're trying to assess these system-level challenges and address them with system-level approaches through collaborations with partners and organizations that are associated with where users currently are at now. And to achieve its scale, of course, we have to work together and we need to understand what's useful and most important for our end users. And because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do isn't necessarily changing public health as it exists today, we're trying to change public health access by redefining what access means. Thank you.